Okay, uh, I want to talk about the factors that impact GFR, glomerular filtration rate, which again is the amount that is filtered out of all of your glomeruli collectively per minute, about 125 mils per minute. Generally speaking, we want to keep our GFR relatively constant because um, GFR is cleansing your bloodstream. So what we don't want to do is we don't want our GFR to go up whenever our blood pressure goes up and go down whenever our blood pressure goes down. We want to try to keep it relatively constant. So let's talk about the ways in which that can occur. First, I want to talk about separating them into local things, intrinsic, paracrine-related things that can regulate GFR, and then systemic things, um, hormones and um, neurotransmitters that can regulate GFR. So I want to talk about local first. So local or intrinsic control, also called auto-regulation of GFR. This is going to be weak, not be able to make big changes, but fast, okay? And remember, whenever you are doing local regulation, you are really only concerned about that one location. You're not trying to regulate flow or physiology or homeostasis for the whole body. You're really just doing it for that one little location. So what I want you to think about is I am only concerned with this glomerulus, okay? All right, so let's go a little closer and remind you of some anatomy that you probably forgot. Do you remember that um, there is a region right by the glomerulus called juxtaglomerular apparatus? The juxtaglomerular apparatus is this little region where the afferent arterial and the distal convoluted tubule come right next to one another. They're not attached or anything, but they're just really close to one another. So juxta meaning next to, next to what? The glomerulus apparatus. This juxtaglomerular apparatus does two different things. It does some local control, some intrinsic with paracrine agents, and then it also does some systemic control. And we'll talk about the systemic control a little later. So the systemic control is mostly not controlling um, the, the filtration. It's going to control reabsorption primarily. But right now, what I want to talk about is what this little area has to do with controlling GFR. So what I want to do first is talk about the concept of myogenic regulation, which we've talked about before. And remember, myogenic regulation is I am an arterial. I only care about this capillary bed. I don't care what happens in the rest of the body. And I'm going to um, control and protect and maintain what's going on with only that capillary bed. So the objective here is to maintain a relatively constant GFR despite ch slight changes in blood pressure, which, by the way, your textbook refers to as mean arterial pressure, mean arterial, the average pressure in the arteries. So I want to keep GFR relatively constant despite changes in blood pressure. So um, what happens is if um, systemic blood pressure increases, the afferent arterial says, I will protect you right here, okay? So if systemic blood pressure increases and I wanted to keep GFR constant, what should I do? If I dilate, more blood's going to go to the um, glomerulus and I'm gonna filter more. So because I'm only concerned about what's happening with this one glomerulus, with myogenic regulation, as the systemic blood pressure increases and I wanna keep GFR constant, you will do constriction. I'm basically just increasing resistance to decrease flow to that thing. Um, but if systemic blood pressure um, decreased and I wanted to keep GFR constant, I would actually dilate, okay? So what this does is like um, if I get up and run to the car, my blood pressure will increase, but I want my GFR to, mean, to be relatively constant. So it'll go, oh, your pressure's going up, but I wanna keep GFR constant, constrict a little bit. But if I lay down to take a nap, my blood pressure will go down, but I want to keep GFR constant because I want to keep cleansing my blood. So I'll actually do a little dilation, okay? So it's just this little area that's going, okay, what can I do for my homies right here, okay? So that's called myogenic regulation. It occurs primarily at the afferent arterial. And then the other thing that happens is um, the tube right here, the distal convoluted tubule, there are cells in the wall that are called macula densa cells. And what they can do is um, if they detect a whole bunch of flow going past them, meaning I just made a whole bunch of pee, what they can do is they can talk via paracrine agents 
to the afferent arterial to tell it, we've got plenty of pee, maybe you can chill out on the making pee, meaning you can decrease your GFR because you've already made a whole bunch of pee. So the macula densa cells of the distal convoluted tubule detect when there's a whole bunch of flow going by them, right? And what they do is they release paracrine factors which cause vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole, which will reduce filtration and therefore reduce urine formation. Okay, so these are all just local things, primarily paracrine, although this one, we don't even know if it involves paracrine um, responses. It could just be uh, reflex, don't actually know. So I want to point out to you how good interactive physiology is for this particular set, uh, this particular bit of material. It's got a whole interactive uh, activity where you can predict whether the afferent arterial could, would constrict or dilate. And by the time you get finished with it, you'll get it. And it's got some quiz questions at the end too. I think it's a really good use of a few minutes of your time. Okay, so that is local or intrinsic control. The objective or the local of intrinsic control is to maintain a relatively constant GFR despite slight changes in pressure. And then, um, for those of you who like um, figures um, and flow charts, this is the figure from your textbook that goes through exactly the same idea. And then the next idea is um, systemic or, and this one's kind of complicated, so I won't actually, actually go into it in a ton of detail, but um, extrinsic control of GFR, which would basically sort of regulate the whole body system at one time primarily just by any mechanism that you will regulate blood pressure. So you can look at this if you want to, but I'm going to basically loop it in with what we learned about blood pressure in the last set of notes, which is um, since GFR is directly determined by blood pressure, almost anything that would increase blood pressure would increase GFR. So because blood pressure impacts GFR, any nervous, any endocrine factor, if something increased blood pressure, it would increase GFR. If it decreased blood pressure, it was de decreased GFR. So you can review the whole section of your cardiovascular phys notes that, about things that affect blood pressure, but there's one exception, one little counterintuitive tweak, and that is this. If you activate the sympathetic nervous system, let's loop in what we learned before, we know that your blood pressure is going to increase, and it increases for three reasons. First, increases st stroke volume, yeah, because it causes ventricular contractility, good. Second, increases heart rate, because you've known that it does that forever. And then third, causes systemic vasoconstriction, okay? So um, you would think, and I would think, that that would mean, of course, that it's going to increase filtration but it actually doesn't. The sympathetic nervous system actually slightly decreases filtration because um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, whether you get them there as a hormone or as neurotransmitter, they cause afferent and efferent, efferent arterial constriction. And therefore, although it sounds counterintuitive initially when you say it, if the sympathetic nervous system acts activates, your GFR actually goes down slightly. And evolutionarily, it kind of does make sense because if you're running away from a bear, do you really want to be doubling the amount of pee that you make? Probably not. So um, mild sympathetic nervous system activity um, causes constriction of the afferent and efferent arterioles. And so your glomerular blood pressure and your GFR decrease slightly. So let's talk about what that has to do with shock and meds and using epi for circulatory system shock. So um, very low systemic blood pressure, right? If your blood pressure drops like from you had a heart attack, so you can't generate any pressure, you just hemorrhaged or you're really dehydrated or you're in anaphylactic shock or something, if it really drops, um, then you're going to have really low glomerular blood pressure and therefore filtration will stop because there's not enough of a pressure differential. So if your mean arterial pressure falls below about 45 millimeters of mercury, no filtration occurs. And these intrinsic regulatory mechanisms like this one, myogenic regulation, they cannot manipulate pressures that low to allow for filtration occurs. So those intrinsic regulatory mechanisms can't do anything about that. Um, and so what will happen is this is called renal suppression. You basically turned off your kidneys because if you don't filter, you don't have anything to reabsorb from 
or secrete into. And um, this will damage your nephrons if it persists for very long, and it results in anuria, which means no urine production. If you're not producing any urine, it's a good indication that your kidneys are not functioning properly. So what would you do in that situation? Well, in theory, you could like give a dose of epi, right? Um, if your blood pressure was really low, you could give a dose of epi, but we can see that giving a dose of epi in this situation wouldn't reactivate your kidneys because it would cause afferent and efferent arterial constriction. So if you have somebody with like um, circulatory system shock that also has um, renal suppression, you can give a different med. And um, in this instance, dopamine, um, which is a vasoconstrictor, it's not as effective at bumping up your pressure as epi but it does not cause constriction of the afferent and efferent arteriole. So um, it will constrict all of the arterioles, well, most of the arterioles in the body, except the one in the kidney. Um, and so you get an increase in systemic blood pressure without a decrease in GFR. Okay, next we'll start on reabsorption.